Hello, everybody, and welcome to Extra Play and Breath of the Wild. It's Zelda. <laughs> Woo -hoo! I am joined once again by our special guest, Josh Foreman, who, if those of you who've not watched any of the previous series with him, he is a, what are you, are you lead artist, senior artist? You have a special title. What is your special title now? My special silly title is uh, Environment Design Specialist. I love it. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, a uh, game industry veteran with a great deal of experience, and he really wanted to play Breath of the Wild with us. Yeah, I did. And I thought that was a great idea. So here we are. As you can see, this is not a new game. We're not starting from complete scratch, and the game audio is muted, which is going to be a problem. Hang on. <laughs> but yeah, this is on uh, my... Uh, game save where I've been playing. I'm about halfway through the game, I think. Two out of four main dungeons taken down. Uh, we wanted to start with a game that was, um, we didn't want to start from complete scratch just so we could, uh, kind of wander around and see more things in this little recording session. You want to go back and look at that first thing I totally a, a brand new player is going to see? So yeah, you, that like, you walk outside and the, uh, opening title screen will play just, like, as you're out here looking at this whole scene here. Yeah. Which, boy, oh boy, is that pretty. Yeah, and I mean, this is this is just a classic in storytelling, visual storytelling. It's, there's your final destination. You see it right at the beginning. So you're going to come full circle. Yep. And you also see what is the kind of primary, well, I guess it's debatable whether the castle or, or Mount Doom is the, <laughs> is the kind of anchor, visual anchor throughout the world. I'd say it's probably the mountain because you can see it from almost everywhere. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, yeah, so it's just fantastic that they did that. Yeah, for sure. Like, and it's you will quickly realize as you start playing after you've walked outside that you can actually walk to anything you can see, which is, I mean, pretty new for Zelda and really cool. Absolutely. Yeah, so as a new player, you're going to come out and you're going to see all this stuff. And most people are going to be either, they're either going to have come from a Zelda game background where they're used to the established norms of <clears throat> of Zelda, um, or they're going to be just gamers in general. I, I don't know. I doubt many people brand new to video games are going to be picking this up, right? So you're going to come in with some basic heuristics, understanding of how video games work. And I think think well me personally when i came out of that cave the first thing i did was try to climb the wall on the left oh there. yeah um just because well i guess i had heard that you could climb everything yeah and i don't know if that's super apparent to everyone like sooner or later you're gonna find so you're gonna accidentally climb something yeah. just by jumping and <laughs> accidentally sticking to it so, oh look i can climb sticking to a surface yeah it's, it's kind of hard to know how to really go about talking about a game that has so much uh, pre, like pre-press and hype. I feel like everyone in the world knew about this game before it came out and kind of understood its, its premise, how different it was from other Zeldas. Yeah, yeah. But when they were designing it, I don't know that they would necessarily know that. So the decisions that the designers were making as they were developing these systems we're going to be informed differently than if they knew. Everyone knows about all these things, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I just kind of want to talk about the game from that perspective, I think apart we might as well. from the, from it's, what everyone would naturally know. Yeah, for sure. It seems to be kind of a part of the process of devs, like educating the player on how the game is meant to be played. Like it's not just pack the game with an instruction manual anymore. And it's not even just have a tutorial at the beginning. Some of that education kind of happens just in the sort of press cycle where you release little videos saying, hey, here's this mis this mechanic and all the neat things you can do with it. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting. Yeah, it's it's kind of a part of development now. Yeah, and like I know at, at, at Arena Net, we now have we have a lot of mixed teams where we have a little bit of, of every department and we even have uh, community people on each kind of sub team. So yeah, it's it's very much a part of the uh, the iteration process is understanding that. And this might be the sort of thing that actually gets you to climb initially as well. Seeing over here just some apples that are kind of glinting and shining. Yeah, and I not knowing how to get them exactly, and then like, oh look, I climb. Well, it's it's interesting that they literally put low hanging fruit at the beginning. <laughs> like most places where you're on the ground, 
you you can interact with the lowest hanging apple yeah, by yeah. yourself, but then you immediately see one that's just slightly too high, which you can jump and grab, which teaches you, you know, that's possible, exactly. or you can climb. And there was a little baked apple lying on the ground here next to where the just early game character is sitting. So, like, you see there's an apple that is baked, so you put you can put it together. I saw apples over here, I see fire over here, and a baked apple lying on the ground. Interesting. And you kind of log that away for the later. Yeah, I want to make a prediction here. I want to say that um, in the same way Super Mario Brothers World 1-1 is kind of used in Design 101 classes, is yeah. here is the optimal ideal way to teach the mechanics of a game, you know, without a tutorial. I think this is going to be used in, for future generations. For, Absolutely. Just because the amount of systems that they are are teaching you in a very naturalistic way is just superbly done. It is amazing, especially because, like, Nintendo doesn't usually do completely systems-driven games like this, like this sort of a uh, huge sandbox world where there's a whole lot of stuff you can do and a lot of those things interact with each other in really interesting ways. Like, it amazes me that Nintendo got this so right on their very first try. <laughs> there's so many games, there's so many studios that are making big sandbox games that you can wander around an enormous world and do tons of things. And uh, this is one of the most fun ones I've played and it was their first attempt. Yeah, that's, it is amazing. I think, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> given historically what they've done, it's it's amazing. I think that it actually was an advantage that this is their first attempt at doing a big open world game. Uh, in, in the sense that they could pull from all the other open world games out there and they don't have legacy systems that they had to deal with, like like an Assassin's Creed or, uh, or you know, Far Cry's half. There are certain expectations that players have about those franchises that don't allow them to really break the mold in the way that Zelda could do. That's true. Like, they have to be much more incremental. If they make radical changes, then it doesn't feel like the franchise they established already. On, on the other hand, they totally broke the mold of Zelda to do this. <laughs> That's so. a good point. <laughs> Even, like, now that I think of it with, like, Ubisoft, you've got Assassin's Creed, big open-world game that kind of functions in a certain sandboxy way, but then that sort of has defined a lot of their other game development as well. Like, Watch Dogs feels very much like this is an Assassin's Creed game in a new setting. Same sort of uh, open-world uh, type mechanics. And Far Cry isn't even that far off with the same sort of, let's go climb towers, get visibility on an area. Here's a ton of different... Uh, here are a ton of different things you can do out in the world. Just a huge smattering of <laughs> little marks on yeah. a map, which, by the way, this this map is getting pretty full over here, but that's because I've been finding stuff. Before then, the map is pretty much empty. Which is delightful. The, it is. The fact that you can look through binoculars and see things that look interesting to you and click on them, and now that's your map marker. That exactly. Was, that's a touch of brilliance. Yeah, you can just see that. Oh, there's a tower over there. I want to go there. Ding. I'm going to hit a button, and now it's on my map. I think. Yeah, there it is. See, it's remembered on your map, and you can change it to a little sticker uh, stamp type thing if you want to just mark it as something specific to check later. It is very nice. But yeah, this is the sort of the direction that most... I expect most players will naturally go from the start. Probably first to that campfire where there's a guy sitting, and I think he directs you over here toward this temple, if memory yeah. serves. Yeah, and actually, if you want to run past that temple to the to the cabin in the woods, I had some some notes on that that I thought were a particularly inspired touch when it comes to to teaching systems without explicit uh, reference. Let's do it! Run, run, run! <laughs> I haven't been back here since some of the early game <laughs> stuff. I'm sure there's tons of things I can do here now that I couldn't before, given my new abilities and equipment and stuff. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> they just—they got that screech just so right. <laughs> it's, it's such a weird it, little sound, but it's it really gets, satisfying. Yeah, it never gets old to me. Just... <laughs> so let's see. Let's go. Oh, I just—I just recently got the monster masks for. Uh, you can get a, a moblin and a, a two others. Oh yeah. Um, masks, and then when they see you. You know, they get the little question mark, they run up to you, and then they think that you're one of them. <laughs> and then they start either doing a dance or some kind of... Yeah, go towards that cabinet. Oh, down here? Okay, yeah. I'm not even sure if I went down here in my, uh, when I played. Maybe I did. Maybe I just forgot. So there's a... There's a... 
canyon on the right they're kind of a shallow one but if you run up like towards the canyon towards that copse of tree of pine trees up there okay so when you when you first go up there the the old guy is chopping down a tree oh. and you're like oh chopping down trees is a thing that's interesting and I, i'm pretty sure there's an axe or something you know there for you to pick up I bet there is yeah and then if you talk to him he talks about how Look, this the way you the direction that you swing your axe, that's gonna push the tree in that direction. He never mentions the chasm there behind you. He never mentions that when a tree falls down you can walk over it, but it's left up to the player to put two and two together. And to me that was just like, oh my this was their biggest signal to me that saying, We respect you as a player, we expect that you have a brain. You know, whereas every, you know, the past seven Zelda games, I feel, didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. Particularly the most recent one prior to this, uh, the most recent console one is Skyward Sword. That one was extremely handholdy. Yeah. It didn't let you figure out the, it didn't really let you figure out the solution to most anything. It presented you with a puzzle and then told you how to solve it and then just... Yeah. Let you kind of go through the motions of doing so. It essentially grab you by the cheeks and yank your face over in that direction. Yeah. And then not only do that and then tell you. And then once you took a step <laughs> forward, it would tell you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Focus the camera directly on your goal, yeah. then on the key to your goal. And then your sword pops out and says, hey, <laughs> there's your goal and the key to your goal, yes. by the way. So, yeah, I did not. I don't think I've been here. Yeah, so that, I mean, there's there's a Zelda staple right there, the classic bomb wall, and I, I think a lot of people when they get here they won't have got the bombs yet. I can't remember which, which of the four temples you get those in, but when I when I came across there, I was like, okay, well, I know where to go when I have a bomb. This also, if if you've talked to the guy about placing markers on the map, that's a good opportunity to start putting markers on there. That's very true. Um, so this this for me, and I, I think. It, that's what's hard about talking about this is that there really because there is no linear A B C D uh, to to the way you approach even this beginning area. It's hard to say, but a lot of people when they this is going to be their first cliff like serious cliff to climb. If you look at the one to your left there, so when I first looked up there, the first thing I noticed was little sparkles from the mushrooms, which yeah. they're not sparkling for we you for some get, reason. We need to get closer. Yeah, but uh, that is just. This right here. So so you, you're forced to climb to get out of your little sleeping chamber, right? And that's pretty much just a flat wall. Yeah, yeah. And this is this one you can um, it's it's just just a beautiful way to ease you into climbing up organic surfaces because you're seeing all these um, mini goals. You know, there's these little ledges, you know, you could get to and rest. There's those sparkly mushrooms. And by now you've figured out you can pick up things that sparkle, so they're drawing you in that direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so again, just a, just another very inspired uh, way to teach a system without without talk. Absolutely. And so many... And there's so much complexity to these systems that they don't even have to teach you all of it. They can just teach you kind of how each system works independently and give you enough hints that some of these systems can be kind of combined or linked together in neat little ways like linked <laughs> like okay you can start fires like you can do, and you can do it numerous ways you can light a weapon on fire and then kind of run it through some grass or a torch or you can use a fire arrow there's lots of ways you can start fires but then fires also like burning grass causes updrafts of wind which is kind of interesting and then you might later kind of figure out on your own oh hey if i use the paraglider on that updraft of wind i could start a fire then paraglide into it and use that updraft to get me to a higher place, which is like, and you feel incredibly smart for figuring all that out on yeah. your own, because they never walk you through that explicitly at any point in the game that I'm aware of. There may be a hint about that in, you know, in the loading screens where they have the little hints pop up. Yeah, but yeah. I don't think a character ever tells you or a cutscene ever shows you. Um, and there's so many different... Uh, Verge like combinations like that, that the game just kind of lets you sort of discover and maybe it does hint at them but then it's kind of on you to try deploying it in some sort of a clever way. I'm going to put on some actual climbing gear to make this a little faster. Because I'm just curious what's on top of this hill now. Yeah, so uh, a neat thing, another neat thing about this cliff is that it's taking into account that 
if you've played other open world games like in Uncharted or Tomb Raider, that are you know, uh, Far Cries, that there are very circumscribed climbing areas. They're they're specified, they're painted, they're marked in some way. And again, this is kind of easing you out of that expectation. It's got those little cliff ledges that you would expect in other games that you would go up to and press an interact button and your character would do a climb. Yeah, yeah. But be- there's just enough distance between them where you you kind of come to the realization organically, oh wait, I can literally go anywhere on this cliff face if I have enough uh, stamina. Oh, I have been up here. I guess I just walked around a different way. Neat. <laughs> yeah, this is where you get one of the one of the four starting thingies. Yeah. It, oh, oh, it must be the uh, the time stop one. Oh yeah, I bet it is. Because in classic Zelda style, they they definitely retain some of their <laughs> some of their classic uh, signatures. Once you get a a let's, weapon, let's you're presented stupid. with opportunities to use it. Yeah. Here we All go. Right. Uh, oh, you couldn't stay on? Oh, I guess not. I guess maybe I need to stand on it. Uh, there go. You know, maybe I didn't want to go flying out there anyway, <laughs> now that I think about it. That's okay. We'll just jump normally. Whoa! I don't know if I've... Oh, yeah, I have seen that before. Okay, cool. Those dragons. Are yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah, the... Uh, I love how many just neat, huge, impressive things like that there are to discover just out in the world in places that they don't draw your attention to explicitly. Yeah, that's... Boy, the, the the difference between what they were doing before and what they're doing now, just giving you free reign to go where you want to go. And it, it's it's not even a matter of like, there's more or fewer things than other open world games. It's literally just giving you the opportunity as a player to say, that looks slightly more interesting to me than this other thing. So I'm gonna strike out in that direction. Absolutely. I think. Uh, someone at work kind of brought it up and I think they are right like just the difference that it makes not having anything any of your little objectives or points of interest be shown on your map initially the fact that it is on you to find them and then kind of add them to your map is like that takes these neat little things from being a chore where you've got like this big checklist of a map full of things for you to go okay I need to go here I need to do this thing and then I need to go here and these other places where it's just a big to-do list of a sheet to just having a huge map that imagine all this stuff is gone and it's just empty and you just so you just kind of it's on you to look around and see huh that looks interesting how do yeah. I get there how yeah. would be the best way to get there and there's and then, virtually and, <laughs> always something to go towards. Oh yeah, like usually multiple things. Like inevitably I will have a goal, like, okay, I want to go there. Half, like before I've even made it a third of the way there, I'll see something else and be like, ooh, and go check it out and forget completely about that. And then probably see something else along the way there and get distracted again. And it's so fun getting lost in this game. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, we will be back again tomorrow with some more of this because, gosh, this is a great time. Thank you all for watching, and we'll uh, see you next time. See ya.